Hi everyone. Um, I'd just like to start by acknowledging uh, traditional owners and paying my respects to their elders past and present. So that's, that's the Wajak people. Yeah, I'd like to thank the organisers for giving me the opportunity to represent CSRO here today. Um, it's been really nice sitting in here and, and listening to the talks this morning. You can see it's a real community and it's, it's really about people building with a, a long-term view. And that's really nice to see. And I really enjoyed the presentations from the scholars. They're very authentic and they're sharing their, their, their experiences in, in a really authentic way. And it was, it's very nice to hear those talks. Um, the other thing I like was seeing the, the international experience and, and uh, the way the Nuffield promotes that, having lived overseas during my research career, the, the benefits you get from seeing how other people do things and the learning you, you bring back, I, I appreciate deeply from my own career. And I think it's really great that, that you, you, uh, the scholars experience this. So, you know, well done with all of that. Um, so I'll be talking about research from CSIRO. Before I do, I was just going to point out some of my colleagues here. But we've got Viv Rowland, who you probably all know is a 2023 scholar. We've got Amy Logan, who's going to be a 2024 scholar. We've also got Jane Brownlee over there, Jonathan Ricchetti, and Yin Lee, who I've lost track of. Here he is. So uh, if you want to know more about CSIRO, there's a few representatives here, and they'll be great people to talk with. All right, um, so yeah, today I'm going to be talking about the research we do in the farming systems program at CSRO, and I'll introduce that a bit. And, re and really the theme I'm, I'm trying to explore is how we take all the data that's available in, in agriculture these days, with more and more coming online you know, every year, and actually turn that into insights or knowledge that, that brings some sort of impact to agriculture. Because there's a lot of data, but but making it work for the industry is is a, a interesting space to explore. So yeah, the farming systems program we're here to do innovation and research that uh, maximises pro profitability, sustainability, and productivity of farming enterprises. We have uh, work in in cropping, in mixed livestock systems, and uh, all around Australia. So that's about 150 staff and affiliates covering all sorts of agricultural science disciplines, um, agronomy, mixed farming systems, a lot of work on digital technology. And uh, I'll talk a bit today about some of the modeling and simulation work we do, which is a real powerhouse with our researchers. And yeah, a lot of work focused on risk management, pests and diseases. So quite diverse research. Um, I'm always uh, amazed by the, the depth and breadth of expertise that we've got with our people. Uh, it's, it's really impressive. Um, based all around the country, so you can see those spots on the, on the map. We go from west coast all, all the way up the east coast and the occasional people in far north Queensland and, and Darwin. So really, really national scale farming systems research, which means we engage with all sorts of different crops, all sorts of different farming systems, tropical, temperate, Mediterranean, um, horticulture. So very, very diverse. Today, I was gonna focus through uh, all of that scope to talk about some examples about impactful use of data. And because of the session we're in, I've looked and thought about examples that, that look at how we use data around water and thought about different scales we operate at. So we, from the paddock scale to the whole of farm and, and beyond. So that's the themes I'll, I'll go through. Um, the first example I'm going to talk about is a, a platform called Waterwise and I'll, it's commercialised with a partner, Goanna Ag. And this is a crop irrigation management system that was developed, uh, came out of uh, cotton farming systems research. We have a huge uh, uh, emphasis on cotton because we, we also run cotton breeding in CSRO. Uh, and a challenge we were addressing here is, is putting water on, on cotton is, is great because it increases your crop yield, but there's also uh, costs and, and environmental uh, costs, you know, financial costs and environmental costs that come with using too much water. So we, our researchers were, were looking at ways to optimise crop water use. 
And you can see here, this is a, a quote directly from a, from a cotton grower um, pointing out that the, the, the temptation when you've got a high value crop like cotton is to put more water on and to, to try and go that way. So there, there is a tendency with, to, to want to put water on the crop and maybe more than you need. Equally, some, some growers will go the other way and they'll, they'll be uh, a bit more miserly with the water and the, the crop can suffer. So getting that right is, is a real challenge. Um, one of the, the nice things about uh, the sort of research background we've got in CSIRO was uh, people recognise that one of the, the, the best ways to know how the crop is going is to use, let the plants tell you themselves. And so this is just, a, this is the only graph I'll put in today's talk, um, but it's just showing that if you have um, a diurnal, this is through the day, temperature monitoring of the crop canopy, that's just using an infrared thermometer type setup, a sensor, uh, when the crop's well watered, it's transpiring and pulling water out of the ground, photosynthesizing happily, and that lowers that water coming through the crop lowers the, the temp temperature of the canopy. But if water starts getting short, then uh, it stops passing water through, loses that cooling effect, and you can see a, 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 a signature of stress. So our people developed uh, field-based, I think I just see it, field-based uh, sensors that you can put in a cotton canopy to monitor the temperature and you can track that. And there's, if you bring that together with a few other things that include a soil moisture probe that's monitoring the amount of water in the, in the soil, uh, you've got weather observations from either on the farm or the Bureau of Meteorology and, and you've got weather forecasts. And if you integrate that with the canopy temperatures that you're tracking every day, you can use that to, to inform irrigation decisions if you've got the right analytical capability, which came from our colleagues in another part of CSRO uh, from our Data 61 business unit. Um, that, that's been very effective, that's set up, that's what we now call WaterWise, commercialised by Goanna Ag, and I think it's, um, I, I, forgot, I think it's called GoField now, I'll have to, I'll, it's on their website anyway. Um, but that's been great, it's been taken up by cotton industry, uh, Goanna Ag stats show that, that it, uh, there are growers who save a considerable amount of water by using the system and equally there are, there are other growers who benefit from putting a little bit more water on their crop and get yield gains from it. So that's water-wise, a use of data. Um, that's just one sensor in a paddock. We're also exploring more complex versions, sort of future versions of this and you hear a lot of people talking about smart farms in the research community. Uh, we've got one outside, whoops, outside, uh, it's at Burra between Canberra and Young in, in New South Wales. And it's, we've set this farm up with sensor networks. We've got soil moisture probes spaced through it. Uh, we've done soil, um, soil mapping, things like EM38 and different soil samples. So I've got a digital soil map and we integrate that with, with satellite data. And what we're doing there is really exploring the, the, the value of more, more spatial, more uh, temporal data on, on a farm. Um, that's the reason I say exploring is because with that much data, finding the, the, the data that's worth measuring that will bring value to a farmer, that's still an open question in a lot of areas. So, but I think the exploration of that's a really important research area. Um, once we've got data like that, we know how to use it though, you can deliver some powerful solutions. Um, one of the examples I've got is to talk about today is a nitrogen, nitrogen risk insurance. Um, this came from work around the sugarcane industry in far north Queensland. And it's a financial tool to, to try and incentivise crop management practices that reduce nitrogen runoff. So here the challenge was, again, it's, it's not dissimilar from the example with water and cotton, that you can put uh, nitrogen on sugarcane, it responds to that by, by, through higher yield, which is great for a grower. So there's a strong financial incentive to put nitrogen on, on sugarcane. But equally, if you put too much nitrogen on, it runs off into the waterways and there's a strong, uh, environmental impact with the Great Barrier Reef. So there's a, there's a social pressure and a, a, a policy pressure to put, put less nitrogen on sugarcane. 
So the research question here was how can we help uh, change growing practices uh, to, to use less nitrogen? And, and the answer that our researchers came up with was actually an insurance product. Um, the way they got to this was through our modelling and simulation capacity. So we, we have a, th a, a platform called AppSim, or Agricultural Production Simulator. And essentially, it, it, it's built up from data from many years of things like soil, um, fertiliser, soil quality and type, fertiliser application, what crop you're growing, you know, the amount of irrigation, amount of rainfall, climate data. And then the, over more than 30 years, people have used that data to develop different modules of modules. So for instance, you can predict the rate that wheat, wheat will grow at at different temperatures with different water availability. You can predict when wheats will flower or, or what their, their yield would be in certain environments. And importantly here, there's a model in AppSim that predicts the yield response of sugarcane to nitrogen application. So you can tell, you can use that to say, well, what's the yield benefit of different amounts of nitrogen? And importantly, you can do that for different soil types and different uh, seasonal weather patterns. So what that allowed our, our people to do was, was set up what's called a parametric insurance product. And the, basically, I'll try and talk your way through it work, the way it works is um, before a grower uh, makes any decisions for the, for the upcoming season, they can do some calculations about the likely impact of adding less nitrogen. And that can go through the, the AppSim model, which can inform a, a premium price. So that's to do with their location and over 50 years of data predicting if you drop nitrogen by X amount, what will that do to crop yields? And then you, you essentially, the aim is to reduce nitrogen without impacting yield, and you can pay a premium to, to, to back up that bet. Then if the insurance purchased, you go into the growing season with that decision, and then there's a, the models rerun with the actual data from that season of the climate and rainfall. And essentially, if, you, if there is an impact of having reduced nitrogen that the model validates, the premium will pay out. So what this allows sugarcane growers to do is to look at applying less nitrogen, but without the risk that they're going to be financially uh, penalised from it. And, and that's, that's a live product now, and the first premiums, of, there have been payouts from this insurance product where people have benefited from, if they have lost yield from adding less nitrogen, then, then they've not been financially penalised. So I think that's a, just a really nice example of how having um, you know, years of research data, modelling and simulation capacity gives you a, a way to use that data to incentivise a positive and, and uh, something that benefits the whole system from reducing the use of nitrogen without lowering productivity as much as possible. And then the last example I've got for today it's just a, a quick, nice story of some of some of our other analytical capability. This this is just a, a satellite image of Ukraine. Um, some of our researchers, we've got a lot of expertise in remote monitoring and using different analytical tools to identify crops. Uh, you can detect when they were sown, what what crop type, um, likely yields using climate data. They brought all that together uh, for for Ukraine. But also with looking, they also looked at shipping activity in the Black Sea. And from all of that, they're able to give an estimate of how much uh, the agricultural output in, in Ukraine's dropped since the, the Russians invaded. Um, and so that gives an accurate real-time sort of impact of, of what that's doing to global food supply. And it's just, a, a, I think, a nice another nice example of the, the even though we're based in Australia, the, the way you can use data and, and deploy research capability uh, is is global. Um, uh, that's not just been applied to situations like Ukraine, there's also w extreme weather events around the world that, um, for instance, they've looked at Mauritius when there's been a, a drought there. And 
yeah, I think that's just another a nice example of how you can use data to in, to inform the agricultural industry. Obviously, you could make decisions. What happens in Ukraine? It came up earlier in the talks. Sadly, what's going on there does uh, affect the the whole system. So I think that's quite worthwhile work. So that's where I'll stop. I'll thank you for listening. Um, yeah. yeah, enjoy the rest of the talks. Thank you.